if people use robo taxis widely, like Ubers with no driver, once they get this working, you could potentially uh, get rid of 2,200 square miles of parking lots in our cities, which is the equivalent space of New York, LA, Chicago, Houston, and Phoenix combined. I mean, massive amounts of, so that's a big deal, right? Um, and, you know, we drive our cars 5% of the time, roughly. 95% of the time, they're just sitting there. They're expensive. Yeah. They break, et cetera. We don't really all need a car. There are people that definitely need cars. We don't all need a car. So that's what kind of got me into it. And, and the, the evolution of the technology. So to start, self-driving, LiDAR is an enabling and one of many enabling technologies in self-driving cars. The big deal is the, what goes on in the brains of the self-driving computer or whatever you want to call it. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the it's it's the, it's the software. It's mostly machine learning now. That's what really is going to make this work. Sure. But you need to be able to see your environment, and it's garbage in, garbage out. So to do a modern, and we'll bounce back to the beginning. But a modern self-driving car, and we're going to accept Tesla. Meaning, not let's not talk about Tesla because Elon Musk thinks lidar is a crutch, and and perhaps he'll be right in the long term. Um, but as we'll hopefully talk about, lidar has been really instrumental in getting self-driving. Um, autonomy to where it is today. You need to, to do it. You need uh, something that can see and really well. And and um, you need much more data than we need. We really just need our eyes, our ears occasionally if there's a, a siren or something. But mm -hmm. it's really our eyes because we have evolutionarily been um, pushed through a process that allows us to take a million shortcuts to recognize our environment with depth and react quickly and all this stuff. A computer is not born with this. No one's, you know, we're kind of born with it. Right. Um, I mean, I taught my teenage daughter how to drive and you recognize maybe we weren't born with quite as much as I thought we were. <laughs> Cause I forgot what, a, <laughs> but we're born with a lot of it. Computers aren't born with it. So you got to give them a lot of info input, right? So they use GPS data so that the, they're very accurate street maps. So it knows what street it's on. And we see that with our maps on cars that are not autonomous too these days. Mm -hmm. You also use radar because it's very, it's cheap and it can see stuff very well. It's a very, very well understood technology. Um, a lot of them use ultrasound also. They'll use magnetometers to see if there's another, more, more ultrasound now. So it's essentially waves bouncing off of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the, the missing piece for a long time was you know, visions, cameras, obviously, is, is, we should probably put that up first, but cameras are really hard. You know, vision systems are hard. They're getting it now. Um, to degrees that are probably, you know, stunning to you and I, uh, to you and me, but, but it's hard vision. It takes a lot of computer processing. And as you know, I, we talked about this, these guys filling airplanes full of computer equipment, right? You couldn't, you couldn't run the code for a vision recognition system very easily 20 years ago. Sure. Yeah. So the missing piece was laser ranging or LIDAR. And so the way it, if, if you understand the way LIDAR figured into autonomy, vehicle autonomy, and the development of it, we actually have a pretty good bead on how this came about. Um, and it started it at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory called SAIL in about 1960, 61, when a PhD student was tasked by NASA. And notice the 61, we did not have Apollo for a few. Kennedy had given his speech, but they were not very far along. They wanted to know whether they could get a moon rover, they could operate a moon rover autonomously. Uh, from Earth, basically mm -hmm. joystick. It. The answer was no. But in the process, they built the Stanford cart, which was like the proto, the ur uh, autonomous vehicle. It had bicycle wheels. It had a lead acid battery on it. It had cables connected to it because it couldn't process. Or, or later, it had a radio, probably. But I think it was cables mainly um, connecting it to the computing resource. And they used cameras to try to guide it, and it was really sloppy. There's some web. If you if you uh, if you um, go into YouTube and look up Stanford cart. There's some, there should be, at least there were some really funny videos of this thing out in a football field. They drew like, like imagine a really drunk guy that lines football fields right. going around <laughs> with the thing to make it a really kind of a challenging path. And this, I don't know if it was a football field or what, but it was a field. Yeah. And this thing is just herky jerky trying to follow this line. Right. Mm -hmm. That evolved um, in the late, I think it was 70s. Um, it could have been 60s. A guy named Hans Moravec, who went on to be a professor at Carnegie Mellon, took charge of the... This was, became a research bed, basically, for all these people that were doing really proto-autonomy work. And Moravec, um, 
was using cameras. And to navigate your environment, you need to know where you are and what's around you. And you gauge that, and then you move to where you want to move. And then you do that again. Now, you and I do this really, really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Moravec created, (laughs) he was watching, I don't know if it was a, a chameleon, a lizard of some sort, with its eyes on the side of its head, right? So it doesn't have good stereoscopic vision. He had one camera and doing stereoscopic vision processing kind of um, uh, real time was just way beyond. These computers were like one five hundred thousandth as powerful as what's in your iPhone right now. You can't yeah. really conceive of how weak, they, how little processing power. And these were research systems, right? These were the best of the best. So he had he put this camera on a, a horizontal. Imagine a four wheeled cart, four bicycle wheels. And in the direction that the cart's pointing, there was a bar, a silver bar that went horizontally across. And then the camera would move from place to place to place to place across that bar over a minute or so. And then it would post process and it would move forward. It took 15 minutes for it to make one of those step stop motions, (laughs) right? 15 minutes. It yeah. took him five. So he got to the point, though, that he could put obstacles in a room and the, the, the cart would be able to sort of navigate its way across a room in five hours. <laughs> five hours, right? But this, that was the beginning of it. And slowly, um, LIDAR sort of, they realized that, well, if we have the laser, then we don't need to do the calculation. We'll know how far stuff away is. The issue is that the laser was a single point of light. So you had to do some games with um, before it was started at this point of light and then it started scanning back and forth. So you'd have like a, a line of laser light that would go back and forth. Mm-hmm. Well, they took that line and they would rotate the line. If you imagine, uh, take a pencil, hold it, um, and then turn it or think of a propeller. Essentially they propellered sure. a line laser and that propeller is your line. So suddenly you have, um, more sp- more of a, a plane, I guess you'd call it, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't think you'd guess you'd call it, it is a plane, <laughs> right? right? So they started using that. Moravec moved to Carnegie Mellon, and then Red Whitaker sort of took the reins uh, with what became the Field Robotics Center. And if there's a father of modern autonomy, I think Red Whitaker would have to be called that. There, it, was, it was parallel development. Um, but, you know, and at the time, Sebastian Thrun, whose name you may know, um, he was the one who won the uh, Dark Grand Challenge in 2005. Um, and he went on to manage the sale lab at Stanford. He worked with as a computer science professor at Carnegie Mellon. So a lot of the pioneering work went on there. And so one thing led to another. They got light, LIDARs from here and there. The military developed a, a LIDAR called the ARIM. It was the, a, a group that used to be Willow, Willow Run Labs in Michigan in the early 19 to mid-1970s. They developed this LIDAR that could actually scan and create um, an image and spot again. Tanks is what they were looking for. Well, mm-hmm. Whitaker's team got a hold of one of those guys, put it on a converted GMC truck, and then created with. I mean, the truck is full of computer equipment again, but that equipment is probably ten times more powerful than the stuff that the AOL guys are using. Right? It's just all these enabling technologies enable, you know, better, faster, cheaper. Right? Mm-hmm. This thing crawled along at like five miles an hour. So it's step stop. More of X took five hours to get across a room. These guys could put what was called Nav Lab One out on a road or uh, wherever they wanted to put it. And it could it could move at about five miles an hour on its own. Okay. So that um over time, the LIDARs kept improving. Um they the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004 which was went by the debacle in the desert. I don't know if you, this is a little while ago, but DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, it's, it's the, the skunk works funder of the military. Like what's this crazy far out idea? And in 2004, sending a bunch of cars autonomously across the Mojave Desert um, and expecting them to get anywhere near the destination was a crazy idea. I mean, mm-hmm. nuts. Because the technology just, it really wasn't there. I mean, Red Whitaker's team and, and many others have done some great work. And nobody finished, right? This thing ends, the, the, the furthest anybody went was Whitaker's team, and they made it like seven miles or something like that in 2004. And people derided it, right? This is a little before your time, but I wasn't into this stuff at all at the time. But I remember reading stories about, ha these guys can't drive. <laughs> the, the autonomous cars are never going to happen, Yeah, whatever. Well, part of the deal was, Travis, is you had the sensor packages weren't the, the computing had gotten to the point where they could manage it, and the GPS was good. Um, 
So you really needed a good obstacle avoidance, right? So you knew generally where you were. You knew there was a hairpin up here, but is there a rock there? Is there another car there? Stuff like, is there a fence post there? And mm-hmm. LIDAR is really good for that. So they were using it for your sort of intermediate range, but they had to use multiple LIDARs because not they were line scanners that they were twisting or whatever. They're pretty basic deal. So they would have like six of these things, stuff that they'd adapted from SICK, which is the, a company founded by er, Erwin SICK. He's a German guy. He's not ill. Um, but it, it was an industrial <laughs> scanner that his company was designed, started his company to uh, keep people from getting their hands cut off in industrial, you know, and stamping machines. Oh, so wow. they're adapting these things that were not made for, for, uh, for vehicle autonomy, right? And air, airborne scanners, well, Regal is a company that's based in Austria that they were using. Red Whitaker used one of those on his. They were expensive and they weren't designed for it. Well, one of the contestants in the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004 was a guy named David Hall. And David Hall was a brilliant engineer who had come to um, Silicon Valley from Boston and started something called Velodyne Acoustics. And Hall, his deal was they made subwoofers, really awesome subwoofers. So like, I don't have a really awesome subwoofer. And if you don't have a really awesome subwoofer, if you have your volume turned up, which at my age, we don't do anymore anyway. But if you do, and then the, the, there's a huge thump in the music, you get massive distortion. It sounds terrible, right? It's just yeah. like, and you, you, you do audio. You know. He figured out a, a, a way to using, um, I can't remember the technology right now. He figured out a way to dampen that. And over time, he figured out a way to use digital signal processors to make that distortion basically go away. So audiophiles are like, this is the greatest subwoofer in the history of the world. Subwoofers are going awesome. Well, by 2005, 6, 7, um, or 2004, say, the, um, and particularly as we moved into the 2008 era when the uh, financial crash happened, the subwoofer business was not doing great. Everybody was going offshore. And Hall has got this factory space that he's not sure what to do with. He's like, I could use a military contract. Maybe I'll do a vision system. He got into like battle bots that he was using. I mean, he's, this is a guy that could do whatever he wanted uh, mm-hmm. with, with things that are made of metal and glass. Point being, he invents a, a stereoscopic vision system that is pretty rudimentary, but he came in like second or third place before getting hung up on a rock of his own. So Whitaker's thing got hung up on a rock in 2004. Hall finished like second or third. He goes back to the drawing board and comes back in 2005, like 18 months later, with this spinning thing on the roof of his Toyota Tundra. He called and he had had just come up with it. He'd had a conversation actually the previous year with a guy uh, from Ford who had said, you know, what we really need is this idea. And Hall had sort of been back in the back of his mind. Hall was the kind of guy who could like say, yeah, I could make this. What it had 64 lasers and detectors, and it spun like 20 times a second. Zoo, 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 zoo. Mm-hmm. And those lasers, is each, they were each associated with a detector. And using that, you had a 360 degree ribbon all the way around the vehicle, knowing where everything was every second of the way. So you didn't have to... Um, understand what you just you didn't have to like save off into memory i just saw a bicyclist back here you see the bicyclist over and over and over again right Right, which is a really big deal it's called keeping state in the in the state of there so paul puts this thing on the top of his tundra for the 2005 race he ends up um not winning that um um uh stanford won the first one and red whitaker's team won the second one i think that's right yeah but no, Whitaker didn't win that one either. Whitaker won the third one. I don't want to get into this. But the point is, Paul's LIDAR is like this, the angels sing. All of these, they called it, uh, Hall called it Woodstock for Geeks, right? I mean, these were people whose names, if you're in autonomy, they were all there, essentially. Mm-hmm. The guys that are running and the women that are, that are involved in some of the biggest autonomy startups and uh, have been subsequently bought by the likes of Ford and so on. We're all at this thing. Most of them were. So Hall comes back for the 2007 urban challenge not as a competitor but darpa says all right everybody who competes gets one of these lidars so hall has remade this thing into what you've probably seen it's like a conical looks like a human head almost except it's and it's on top of uh, of the car and it spins right. around they're white generally aren't they um silver i don't know uh, okay they have different ones i think now. i've seen them yeah so that design has been picked up by lots of different people mm-hmm. um, in, in some iteration and that is really that lidar, David Hall's lidar, is what enabled the perception to be good enough 
for most of these teams uh, that are continuing to develop this technology, auton- vehicle autonomy, to do what they do. Mm-hmm. And Hall is now, it's called Velodyne LiDAR now. They, I think they still make, um, in China, uh, subwoofers, but LiDAR is the business. Mm-hmm. They're going public um, in one of these reverse uh, like special, app, uh, what do they call it, SA. I don't know. They're going public. There's another one that's going public called Luminar. Um, and yeah, it's the real deal now. Man, okay. So is that so that was kind of the the limiter back then was that they they were kind of able to start to do the processing speed and all that kind of stuff but they really needed lidar to give them an accurate image of what was around them and that's that's what they were able to do. Yeah, I mean lidar took care of with the help of and they were using visual cameras, they were using radar. Mm-hmm. But the sensor fusion and lidar being really the critical component um was what got them out of the sort of garbage in garbage out, out problem with with vehicle autonomy. So it was truly a massively important uh, sensor. Right. Yeah. So do you, um, cause I mean, like now just kind of from my perspective, it seems like Tesla has the furthest uh, step into kind of autonomy as like a, a company, I guess, or releasing to the, you know, to consumers. Um, but they don't have LIDAR, do they? No. So Elon Musk is, uh, I, my understanding is that they actually do use it in their testing. Uh, oh, okay. No, none of the production vehicles. I mean, L- Musk is right. LiDAR is that spinning thing on the top of these vehicles. Hey, thanks for watching this video. This is my dog, Murphy. And these are dog treats. Now I'll give Murphy one of these dog treats. And all you have to do is press the like button. Just press that little like button right down there at the bottom of this video. And this sweet, adorable, cute little puppy gets a treat. All thanks to you. All right, you did it? Okay, I believe you. You said you did it. There you go, Murph. She got that treat because of you. Now, I'll eat one of these treats, and all you have to do is click that subscribe button right there, pointing to it. Just click that subscribe button, subscribe to Curiosityness with me, Travis DeRose. Get lots of good video, and I'll eat this treat. All right, you did that too? That's not very good. Girl, not very.